Hi guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan. In this video, I want to take a few minutes to share with you a little bit about the try, catch, finally statements in PowerShell. Now you'll want to learn about try, catch, finally if you're writing any type of code really, because what it does is it helps you to handle error messages in a calculated fashion. So as you're writing PowerShell scripts, you've probably seen a bunch of red text pop up on your screen before with some kind of error message indicating something like a path isn't found or you can't connect to a remote computer or something along those lines. So how do you fix those types of error messages and how do you handle those types of error cases? You know, do you log it to a file? Do you send an email notification? Do you send a tweet out to Twitter? Uh, there's a whole bunch of different actions that you can take as a result of an error occurring. But in order to handle that error, we first need to know how to trap the error and then determine what type of error message it was and then act on it based on that type. So what we're going to do is jump over here into Microsoft Visual Studio Code, where I have uh, PowerShell installed on my Mac OS, and I also have the PowerShell extension installed. So if I hit Command B and come over to the left-hand side here, you'll see that in the extensions section, if I scroll down a little bit, you'll see that I have the PowerShell extension installed here. And if I hit Control tilde on my keyboard, that's the default shortcut that pops open the PowerShell integrated console, which is available inside of Visual Studio Code after you install the PowerShell extension. And of course, you have to make sure that you have PowerShell installed on your local system as well. So that's just a little bit about my setup here. Let's go ahead and just create a new file here using Command N, and then I'll hit Command K and then M to search for and select the PowerShell language mode. So as you can see in the top left corner here of my file, I have the icon is changed to a PowerShell icon, which indicates that this file is going to execute in PowerShell. So now we can start coding a little bit. So let's take a look at a command that might throw an error message. So for example, if we do get item path uh, non-existent configuration file, so if I hit command or function F5, you'll see that it runs that PowerShell script inside of my PowerShell terminal here down at the bottom of Visual Studio Code. And you'll see that it looks for this path, non-existent configuration file in the current directory, and it's saying it can't find it because it does not exist, which is true. That file doesn't exist on my system. Now, if you look over here, it says item not found exception. So that is the type of exception. There's lots of different types of exceptions out there. And I actually have a separate video on how you can create custom exceptions of your own. Um, but this is going to be the particular type of exception that was thrown when we ran this command. So let's go ahead and try a different command. Something like, so let's try something like get item path null. And if we hit function F8 to run just that line, you'll see that we get a different type of error message here saying we can't bind the argument uh, $null to path because it's null, right? You can't bind a null value to a parameter unless you explicitly allow null values. And you'll see that the type of exception is a little bit different here. So we have a parameter binding validation exception instead of an item not found exception as we had in the previous example. Now the reason I wanted to show you these two different examples is because they operate a little bit differently by default in PowerShell. So first let's go ahead and use the try catch statement to handle these exceptions. So let's start with the first example here. So I'll comment out line number three, and then I'll wrap the get item command inside of the try statement. And then every try statement must also have a catch statement. So if you don't specify a catch statement, you'll see this little squiggly line appear, and it says the try statement is missing its catch or finally block. So we have to specify that, and we'll do catch. And then down here is where the code will put that will run in response to that exception occurring, right? So this is going to catch any type of error message. So it could be an item not found exception. It could be a parameter binding exception or anything like that. The try catch statement that we have here, we haven't specified any type of exception. So it's going to run no matter what type of error occurs. So we'll just put some useless response like, hey, we're going to just echo out a text message that says an error occurred. So if I do function F5 to run that, 
something odd happens here. So what happened? We expected it to try to run that get item command on line number two, fail, and then run our catch block, right? That's what you would think would occur, but that's not what occurred. And we're going to explore why that is. But first, I want to replace the get item command on line number two with the other example that we had. So now instead of the non-existent file, we're passing in this null value. So let me comment out line number eight, and we'll run that. And sure enough, this time we get this text back that says an error occurred. So why is it that when we ran get item with a non-existent path, we didn't catch our exception, but when we ran get item with a null path, we did catch our exception and run our exception handler code under the catch statement? Well, PowerShell has two different types of error message or error exceptions rather, and one is called a terminating error and the other is called a non-terminating error. And depending on the command that you run inside of PowerShell, you might get either a terminating error or a non-terminating error. So a terminating error will actually terminate your script if the exception occurs, whereas a non-terminating error will allow your script to continue executing. And so in the first example where we had the non-existent file, what ends up happening is that this is a this is this is throwing what's called a non-terminating error and so that causes the the statement to basically look like it succeeded so even though it threw an exception message according to powershell's execution engine it kind of thinks that that command succeeded and so it's not going to catch that error message and run our our exception handler so what we need to do to take that non-terminating error and catch it is to actually change the, the non-terminating error into a terminating error. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. Uh, first of all, every PowerShell commandlet out there should have these built-in parameters. One of them is called error action. And the error action parameter allows us to specify a custom action that occurs when, or not, not a custom, but a, a specific action that occurs when, that, when an exception is thrown by that command. So when we run get item on line number two here, the error action that we specify will, uh, will take place when an exception is thrown, if an exception is thrown. Now, if get item succeeds, it won't throw any exceptions and it'll, it'll come back as successful. But what we wanna do is change the error action to stop. So by default, the error action is to continue. So even if that get item command throws an exception, it will continue executing our script as if that error basically hadn't occurred, right? So what we need to do is basically tell it, no, if you throw an exception, if get item throws an exception, we want you to stop execution. And what that's going to do is it's gonna change the exception into a terminating exception, and it'll force our catch block to run. So let's hit function F5 to run this again. And now sure enough, get item with a non-existent path will actually run our catch handler correctly. So you don't need to worry about that if you have a statement that like this one down here on line nine that already throws a terminating error. As you noticed, we caught that terminating error and executed the catch handler. So you only have to set the error action for commands that throw non-terminating errors. So there's one other way to specify the error action. So let's say that we had a bunch of different statements in here. It would be very repetitive to have to specify error action stop for each one of these uh, commands, right? So there's a, there's a more efficient way to do this. So what we can do is take away all these error action stop parameters and specify it once for the entire script. And the way that we do that is by using this built-in variable called error action preference. And this is built into every PowerShell session out there. It should always be available in any PowerShell session, regardless of whether you're running PowerShell core or the Windows version of PowerShell that exclusively runs on the Windows.NET framework. So what we'll do is we'll set that error action preference to stop. If we try to change it to something else like stop to, you'll actually get an error that says, hey, you specified an invalid value and these are the supported values for this particular built-in variable. But uh, we, we, we know that we wanna specify stop there. So we're going to go ahead and just change that back to stop. And then if we hit function F5, 
to run this. Now you'll see that when we run get item with a non-existent path, we are changing those non-terminating errors into a terminating error, and we are properly catching our exception. Now, something else I want to point out here is that if I had a statement in my try block that came after the get item command, like write host, you should not see this. So because the get item command is throwing an exception, it's going to terminate all of the other commands that are inside of my try block. So if I hit F5 again, or function F5 on my Mac keyboard, you'll see that I only get the text outputted down here called an error record. Whereas on line number five here, I specified write host, and I said you should not see this. And sure enough, we're not actually seeing that in the output of the script. So keep in mind that once your try block terminates, none of the statements after the command that caused that exception to occur will be executed. Now I want to dig into a little bit more on the specific exception handlers. So we, right now we've had a single catch block, which is currently catching all different types of exceptions. However, you can actually specify more than one catch block. And so what we're going to do here is say catch, and I'm going to say item not found exception. And as you'll see, I put the exception class in square brackets. So that's how we denote an exception class that we want to catch. And let's change, because we're catching a more specific error, let's change this error message that we're actually posting out to something that's a little bit more specific. So the item specified was not found. So now let's go ahead and hit F5 to run this again. And you'll see that we get back this text, the item specified was not found. Because again, this get item command is throwing an item not found exception. However, what if we ran this command instead? So now we're going to get this parameter validation failed. Or, or uh, let's, let's give this a try here. So now what you'll see is that we get this um, parameter argument validation error. It's saying null is not allowed for the path parameter. And what's happening is our catch statement is not actually running. Actually, let me uh, comment out line number 11 here really quick and just rerun that. Yeah, so parameter argument validation error. So because our catch handler only knows how to handle the item not found exception, we're not catching this other type of exception, um, parent argument validation error null not allowed exception. So what we need to do is do a catch statement, a second catch statement down here, and we'll just duplicate our write host statement and say write host parameter binding has failed. And then what we'll do is search for parameter, uh, let's see. Let's just run this command on its own again to see what the exception is. Let's set the error action preference back to continue really quick because I think that's interfering with my exception. Yeah, so the parameter binding validation exception is what we want to catch here. Okay, so now we'll change this back to stop. And now if I do F5, you'll see we get an error here that says parameter binding validation exception can't be found because we haven't specified the fully qualified path to it. And it looks like it's actually, the class name is actually parameter binding exception. I'm not sure why it isn't accepting validation exception, but let's do parameter binding exception and rerun this. And now you'll see that we get the text back from that script that says parameter binding has failed. So basically what's happened is because this get item command on line number four has thrown a parameter binding exception, 
PowerShell is actually skipping over this catch block for item not found exception because that exception type is not being thrown inside of our try block. Whereas the parameter binding exception is being thrown. And so now we're getting a more specific error message based on the nature of the exception that's inside of our try block. So you can specify multiple catch statements, just keep that in mind. And you do generally want to keep them specific because if you have different types of errors that could potentially be occurring inside of your application, then you wanna make sure that you're catching the right type of error message and taking the proper calculated response to each type of error message. So the last thing that I want to cover here is the finally statement. So the finally statement is always going to execute and it's typically used for things like cleaning up any resources that your script might have utilized in the try block. So if in the try block, maybe you open a file handle or you open a database connection or something like that, and you want to clean that up after an, an error occurs, the finally block will help you to ensure that even if an error occurs inside of your try block, you can always clean up those resources, clean up those connections, clean up those file handles, and things like that later on. So what you'll notice is that if we specify some code here, like closing all open file handles, if we rerun this script, now we get back our useful error message here, parameter binding failed, but we also get the finally block that executes uh, saying closing all open file handlers or cleaning up resources or, or whatever ha you might have in your particular use case. So that's just a quick overview of the try, catch, and finally statements. I hope that this has been valuable for you. The key takeaways from this video are that there are different types of exceptions. So make sure that you understand exactly which, which type of exception class is being thrown by your specific commands. And make sure that you are setting the error action preference to stop, to turn any non-terminating errors into terminating errors so that the try block in your PowerShell scripts will properly catch those errors and then pass them into the catch statements. And then the finally block can just be used to clean up any resources that your script needs after an error occurs or even if no error occurs, right? So even if we commented out line number four here and reran it, we would still see this closing all open file handles or that finally block executing. There are some other things that we could cover here. Um, like for example, there is actually a PS item uh, variable that's available. It's called an automatic variable in PowerShell. I didn't want to get too deep into the weeds for this particular video, but if you do want to access the exception that was thrown, you can actually reference that using the PS item variable. So what you should see here is if we uncomment line number four, and we echo out that PS item, you'll actually see that it's not thrown in red text, but it's actually thrown in white text because we, it's not an actual exception in this case. Um, but you can actually examine that exception in more depth and access some of the different properties on it. So I'll leave that to you guys to explore. Uh, thanks again for watching. If you liked this video, please leave a thumbs up and leave a comment in the video with any other tips and tricks that you want to share with the PowerShell developer community. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Cheers.